Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm just waiting for folks to get in our room today. We're so excited that you're joining us for our new exchange program. We'll get started uh, momentarily. <laughs> Feel free to mention in the chat where you're calling in from. Welcome to NIMWA Exchange, a spinoff of the award-winning pandemic live stream series, BMA NIMWA, which we partnered with the Baltimore Museum of Art to create. I'm Addie Gayoso, NIMWA's senior educator. Uh, hello, viewers. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today's episode is CART Captioned. Um, thanks to Joyful Signing and their staff for making this possible. To see the live captions, click on the CC button in Zoom. And if you have questions about how to do that, just drop me a line in the chat and I will help you. Um, please add any questions you have to the chat or even in the Q&A, and we will do our best to keep an eye on those and to address them before the end of the episode. For those of you who are unfamiliar, um, NIMWA Exchange um, is an opportunity for NIMWA to host special guests and to center women creatives. We consider topics relevant to our world and offer insights into collaborations NIMWA is fostering while its museum is closed for renovation. During this time of change, we are excited to exchange ideas with guests and viewers. In November, we were joined by Baltimore-based curator and gallerist, Mertis Badoya. Badoya uh, spoke about her work um, at Gallery Mertis in Baltimore um, and the work that they do nationally and internationally to represent artists with a focus on contemporary African-American women artists. If you missed the show, you can watch it on the museum's YouTube channel, and I will add the link in the chat momentarily. I'm happy to introduce Ginny Trainer, NIMWA's senior curator, and uh, her special co-host today, Hannah Shambroom, NIMWA's exhibition coordinator. Thank you both for being with us. Hi, Addie. Hi, everyone. Um, Hannah, so happy to have you back with us again. You've been on a few times, and it's always a pleasure. Um, you've been really instrumental in um, making this series look out possible during the, the renovation of the building. Um, and this series is one in which we install large scale artworks on the exterior of the building, usually anchored to the scaffolding that's surrounding the building. Um, so we really look forward to hearing your perspective today. Yeah, thanks, Ginny and Addie for having me back. Um, I'm so excited today to speak with you both, um, as well as Austrian-based artist and feminist Katarina Sibolka and one of her team members, Margarita Clausen. And Katarina and her team are responsible for the current lookout installation um, that anyone local to DC may have seen on the side of our building, um, titled Solonga 27, which will be on display on our exterior through the end of February of this year, February 26th, 2023. So welcome, Katarina and Margarita. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, welcome, um, Hannah, Eddie. And Chani, thank you for the invitation. I'm really excited to be part of this program. Well, Hi. Sorry, Margarita. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> Hi. So uh, I think we should start out today by hearing a little bit more about this Lookout series. And Hannah, I think you're the person to, to tell us a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. So Lookout is NIMWA's newest public art project um, conceived just in this past couple of years. Um, Lookout presents large-scale commanding artworks on the exterior of the museum's building using um, sort of as a canvas the scaffolding that has been covering the museum for the past you know year plus during the current building renovation. Um, and Lookout as a project allows the museum to continue to champion women artists, even while the interior galleries are temporarily closed. And it also calls attention to the powerful transformation that's happening within the museum, which we are so excited to unveil um, next fall. And many um, who are tuning in today might recall the first iteration of Lookout, which was on view from March till October of this year. Um, and that was a, I'm sorry, um, March till September of this year. And that was a large scale work by DC based artist, Miss Shalov that was titled Reseeded a Forest Floor Flow. Um, so you can see an image of that there that covered 
um, the facade of the building that kind of overlooked the confluence of H Street and 13th Street and New York Avenue. So it was sort of that long skinny side of the building. Um, for this current installation, um, we've shifted to the north facing facade of the building. Um, so this work, so long with 27, is the second installation in the Lookout series. And I just want to mention briefly that this project has been generously supported through a grant from ShareFund, as well as supported by members of NIMWA. So thank you to the sponsors. We're so grateful to be able to um, be displaying this work and working on this Lookout series. Um, I'm going to let Katarina and Margarita describe their process in a bit more detail, but to give a brief overview, Solonga is an ongoing series that addresses gender-based inequities and social power structures that exist throughout the world. And we are very excited that this work at NIMWA is the first Solonga net in the United States. Uh, so long as German for as long as, and you'll see um, as we share some more images that each net follows the same um, sentence structure and phrasing. So you see here, um, it starts as long as, and then the phrase ends, I will be a feminist. Um, and, you know, the idea is kind of thinking about areas where inequity exists. Um, so as we continue with this program, and as we hear more from Katarina and Margarita, I just wanted to invite anyone following along to write their own as long as sentence and to share it with us in the comments. Yeah, I look forward to reading some of those. I'm I'm sure um, there'll be some good ones. And we'll talk a little bit more later about how this particular phrase was chosen um, for NIMWA's building. But um, let's hear from the artist herself, Katerina. And it would be wonderful if you could tell us a little bit about um, how you embarked on this project. I understand that um, the birth of your first child was really an impetus for feminist projects like Solanga. And so if you could speak a little bit more to your personal experience of becoming a mother and kind of how that changed the trajectory of your work as an artist. Sure. Um, I'm working as a feminist since for a long time, um, since the birth of my daughter in 2006. And before, I, I have to be honest, I wasn't aware of gender inequality so much. So um, I experienced this privileged life where men and women seem to be fully equal. And I always thought if I have a good education and and if I work hard, I could achieve whatever I want. So then there was this birth, the birth of my first child, and it changed everything. Of course, there was this um, big wave of joy, and but I was not prepared for what came after that. And I just want to little explain the background here in Austria. It's also similar in Germany that we have a very well functional social system. Um, we have um, these protective laws um, before and right after birth. We have um, fully paid leave for at least eight weeks before and eight weeks after birth and also paid parental leave for up to two years. And usually people take one year and stay with the kids. But when I say people, I mean mothers because fathers, they don't um, take this parental leave so much, only very few. So I, I, I could imagine that probably it sounds like a, like a dream scenario for you in the US. And of course, we are also very lucky to have um, so much publicly financed support for families, but it has, has also this um, downside, downside too, because um, women are automatically expected to stay at home and do all childcare and all housework. And this break in their careers is also later used against them. Um, 
for example, they have fewer promotions or less responsibility, they get less responsibility. Of course, they have fewer, we, we, we get fewer full-time positions and thus less pay and also a, a, a smaller pension later. And if you want to go back um, early, let's say with a six month old baby, um, you face these structural problems that it's hard to find a place where you can leave your baby. And women who return to work soon are judged. So you have this social pressure. And now in my personal situation it was like this that I just started um, started to study with 29 um, again art at the Academy of Fine Arts and soon later I I was pregnant so my husband had a higher income so I was the one who stayed at home and the one who stays at home has no has no control over the time i think this is always the thing with the time and so i felt more and more isolated and also powerless and trapped and yeah i tried to juggle studying working as an artist and motherhood and always ended up feeling inadequate in both roles so all the equality i thought i had was suddenly gone but the good thing as an artist, um, I, I, I was able to channel the anger. And so um, I began developing my first feminist projects. And, and now, yeah, here, for example, you, you see um, it's a series called um, Survivors. Um, it's... For example, this number one is about Maria Antonia de Alinda y Correa. She's an Argentine legend. And I translate um, this legend into a or legend, the legend into modern day world. Um, this in a world of full equality. Or another work um, you could see here, the next one, it's a neon installation. We certainly don't do it for the money. Um, it was also in this time, I think it's, as an artist, I felt like this. As a mother, I felt like this. Um, I think um, as, a, as a woman, you often feel like that you don't do it for the money. I don't think there's enough money in the world to, to compensate. <laughs> mothers in particular true no I, I love this because you can you can read it so many different ways you know it applies yeah to so many different different facets um so you began this so long a series in um 2018 is that correct yeah. yeah um so what do you think of since you've been you've been doing this now for a number of years um your most exciting and challenging installations? The most exciting installation, of course, surely was coming to DC. Um, it's more than one year ago when I got this email um, and the, the, you contacted me and asked if I would be interested in creating a Solange Net. Solange means as long as, I have to mention this, at the museum. And you, you, it was written in the email two blocks away from the White House, and I could hardly believe my eyes. Um, what an offer, you know, to be so close to the center of power. And have we already come this far that we are already with these feminist topics so close? So this was for sure the most exciting um, moment. The most challenging moment was our first um, international net. In we we came from Austria across the Mediterranean Sea to to Morocco to Rabat, and um, the story was like this: that 
the French curator Abdelkader Damani saw the picture, which we, we just saw before, as long as the art market is a boys club, I will be a feminist, um, at the symposium in Tunisia. So he invited me to be to take part um, in the first biennial worldwide, exclusively, exclusively featuring art by women, but in Morocco, which is really interesting. And, and he wanted to show this picture and he called me and I thought, come on, um, let's do a net there. And he said, no, no way, we can't do this because um, it's really hard to find construction sites there that they have different safety requirements. And so, but I, I don't know, he continued searching for construction sites. And after a lot of weeks, he said, I don't have um, a, like a, a scaffold, but I have the facade of the museum of King Muhammad VI. Um, and this have these arcades of double arches, which is quite of similar of, to a scaffold. So then the process started of searching for the right words. This was the first net where we, um, where we included local people and communities to find the, the, the sentence for the building. So I traveled there. I had a, had a lot of interviews with feminists, with women there. And yeah, so after a long period of time, after um, texting hundreds of as long as sentences with my team after a lot of sleepless nights, because it was so exciting. Um, we found this sentence and we, we it was so important for us to do to, to not come in from the outside and speak for Moroccan women. That's why we included so many people. And we also didn't want to create a scandal because it's it's installed just opposite the royal palace so it was really a, a very intense and really exciting process and yeah we wanted to create a dialogue and open communication like always and yeah this is the moment of the of at night the night event where we unveiled the the net and you see also in the picture all the different people um, passing by so it's a very we didn't know how the public will react we didn't have so much experience at these times it was the seventh net and we also did one in arabic um, um, yeah in the one is in english the other one is in arabic you can see here on the side there, it was also hard with the translation because they told me that there is not even a word for feminist in the Arabic um, language. It's, of course, there is a word, but it's more a description. And so, yeah, there were a lot of challenges and, and it was really at the next morning, the net was still there. This was the, I was very happy about this and there were also a lot of reactions um, on Facebook and social media um, that for example feminist groups use the net as a backdrop as you can see here and um, there's also the curator called me later um, and told me this this story and which was very touching for me that um, the, he told me the museum director was visited by an old woman who asked, is this your museum? And when he said yes, she said, thank you for the sentence. I have been waiting for this all my life. And yeah, these are the moments where, um, yeah, which makes me full of joy that I have the possibility to, to to realize this project and yeah. That's incredible. And what a reaction to, to that particular installation. Um, all the images are just so amazing of that one. Um, and I think 
that example also really, you know, in your describing kind of the process of, um, you know, finding the site and drafting the phrase and getting it up on, um, of course, the side of the building. I think that that really speaks to the collaborative nature of the project and just how much of a team effort that is. I know from working with you and Margarita, like I saw firsthand how much of a team effort, um, you know, the whole process is from drafting the phrase to, you know, the actual stitching to the process of installing and working on the construction site and everything. Um, so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about the collaborative nature of this project and, you know, the different types of people you work with and just how it all comes together. Yeah, sure. It's my pleasure. Um, so there's different phases with different parts of uh, different collaborative elements. So one of them, of course, is with the institutions um, that that host us um, and that we present the network together. Um, that's always a, a very um, interesting process, depending on whether it's an art institution or a university or um, at times also just a plain regular construction site uh, with no um, artistic or intellectual institution behind it. Um, uh, so that's one part. And then uh, since uh, ever since Morocco, as Katerina just described, we've been incorporating this uh, community uh, process as well, which is also very collaborative. Sometimes um, it comes in the form of workshops. Sometimes it's um, calls for submissions uh, as in the memoir. And um, then we go into the next phase, uh, which I'm also part of and um, our another team member, Tina Temer, who was also in Washington. Um, and we sort of start this whole group thinking process, uh, a lot of group chats and ideas and brainstorming and uh, researching uh, the sites, uh, the communities around them, and um, then this phase of wordplay and um, finding the right topic. And uh, we have um, a few rules that we follow or a few um, guidelines that we set ourselves uh, that we set up for ourselves which are that we want to um, stay have a positive um, phrase we don't want to be accusatory or um, you know uh, reprimanding in any way we really want to invite people to uh, think about the sentence and to start communication and to start discussions and we'd like to include um, as many people as uh, possible. And um, for the wording itself, we try to um, play around with words, with phrases. We like um, witty uh, little jokes or um, yeah, try to make it a bit light and, and fun. And also uh, we like to um, stay away from uh, uh, from words and expressions that might be too complicated or too abstract. We, uh, since it's a public project that speaks to everybody, we want to keep it um, as accessible as possible. So, um, yeah, maybe you'd like to say something about the uh, submissions process, how that worked at uh, Nimwa? Sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, I think as Margarita just very well described, um, you know, the whole kind of um, process for developing a phrase, um, you know, you and your team receives quite a bit of public input for that. Um, and I understand in the past, you've done some interviews and things like that. Um, you know, of course, this being more of an international project, and then COVID being so present um, to sort of handle that um, in our collaboration with you at NIMWA, um, we developed a um, online submission process that we were able to implement. Um, and, you know, in working with you both, we kind of understood the way that you like to frame these um, calls for input. So with that in mind, um, as we developed this, you know, sort of form or um, submission process where people could submit answers, we 
um, centered it around a couple of key questions. Um, one, how long will you be a feminist? And two, how much longer must we stand up for equality um, to sort of get people thinking about ongoing issues, um, you know, of course, areas um, where, you know, this still needs to be addressed. And then um, thinking too, sort of about the museum and our mission, we um, paired that with asking, what is your feminist vision for the arts and beyond? Um, and with those questions in mind, we facilitated a survey that um, was shared out publicly on our website through social media, um, I think through some emails. So we really sought to receive feedback from as wide an audience as possible, um, you know, not just women, but, you know, men, non-binary people, um, people of all different backgrounds, you know, we were really hoping to receive um, as wide an array of responses as possible. Um, and I would say that we definitely did. Um, the survey was anonymous, of course, but the responses we received addressed a huge variety of topics. Um, many, you know, given the time, were concerned with bodily autonomy and reproductive rights. We had a number that addressed um, motherhood and sort of, um, you know, parental leave and, you know, equality in the workforce. Um, we saw many about income inequality. And then, you know, of course, I think with our core audience, we saw many that dealt with representation in the arts and other professional fields as well. Um, and I noted some that I thought were great examples. Um, so I'm going to read just three of them that um, I thought kind of captured the general themes that we were receiving. Um, the first one, as long as mothers are expected to be superheroes, I will be a feminist as long as museums show more paintings of women than by women, I will be a feminist. And then as long as I need to fight for my daughter to have the same rights that I have, I will be a feminist. Um, and so, you know, I think we, we saw that many of these themes that came up echoed sentiments and calls for action that we've been hearing for decades, many revisited issues that, um, you know, have been sort of fought for, for, a long time across multiple generations. And I really loved that as you and your team sort of workshopped all of these many, many themes um, that, you know, you all kind of came up with this phrase that I think acknowledges that, you know, a lot of progress has been made, but there is still a lot of work to be done to achieve um, true equality. Yeah, there's For some... Sure. <laughs> There's something about the um, the generalness of this statement that I really love because it can apply to all of those topics that you just brought up, Hannah. Um, and I think you know each person can kind of you know get get their own meaning out of it in a way. Um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in the aesthetic of this work. Um, it's intentionally made to look like cross stitch or embroidery, which of course is a um, uh, medium and a material that is usually associated with women, uh, kind of you know women's work. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you arrived at, at the decision to uh, use this aesthetic and, and how given the scale of it, how you go about doing it. So when I started with this project, I was asking around in my surrounding, so how long, how much longer do I have, to, do, do we stand up for, do we have to stand up for gender equality? And I got all these different answers and I was wondering, okay, what to do? And then one day I was in front of this huge construction site and I thought, oh my God, this is really a great place to show these, these sentences in the public space and also on this male dominated um, construction site. I think only in the NEMWA, I experienced so many women um, now on the construction site, but on all, in all the other ones, it, there were most male men. So um, I knew where I want to show my sentences, but how can I show them? Printing would have been one possibility, 
but then I came up with embroidery because embroidery is a is a um, is a handcraft which our women are women are doing and they did it for centuries um, at home very small embroideries um, and now we do it in a very huge scale um, it's also this haptic quality it's um, you see the, the the process is visible the time and the energy that goes into making each piece so I think embroidery these um, women handcraft on this male dominated or um, construction site is a very good um, relation. Yeah. And the, and the fact that it is so big, like you cannot ignore it because it's, it's and it's it's hot pink, right? It's is it always it's always hot pink. It's hot pink, it's mag magenta, um, we say magenta, the color, and um, I choose this color. I think normally it's red, the thread in when we, so usually it's red. So in the old, like the farmers make like, you know, but we, we used magenta or we use magenta because um, in, in Austria, we have these different parties that are identified with different colors. And I, I wanted to choose a color which, um is not associated with any of these parties so that's why i choose um this color there's there's no magenta political party no there's <laughs> not yet <laughs> i can that's... remember magenta political party so um before we kind of turn it over to our audience to see if there are any questions they'd like to ask um, just very briefly, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you are working on now? Um, yeah, I'm doing a lot of Solange sentences. I will, we will continue doing this. We are invited um, in other cities, what we are, which we are, we are very happy about. But um, once a year, I try to make another big project. So this is one which I did last year, what you can see now. Um, I was invited at a, at a residency in Regensburg and Regensburg is a really beautiful German city and which was not destroyed in the Second World War. That's why the medieval um, center of the town is now um, UNESCO World Heritage and so I, I, when I was there for three weeks or for one month, um, I, I found out that on this bridge, on this medieval ditch, bridge, which is the tourist, it's huge, it's a very long bridge, it's the touristy highlight of Regensburg, that there was um, until 1600 punishments by water um, at death sentence um, by drowning, which means death sentence by drowning. So um, I, I did this, um, I realized this rescue bowl, which you can see here, it's 52 feet. So it's a huge rescue bowl, which with, with which you can't work. Um, and this installation is dedicated to all the women who lost their lives there um, with these punishments by water. Because this punishment was especially um, done or applied to women with children out of wedlock or women who ended their pregnancy. And so is, is this part here that looks like a hanger, that's a reference to kind of... Exactly. Yeah, abortions done kind of at home, yeah. That's in, I didn't know that, that um, that's what the punishment was used for. The first thing I thought of was witchcraft, too. I feel like a lot of women were punished, you know, for this idea that they that they might be witches. But it's interesting to hear that, you know, then, as unfortunately now, you know, the, you know, women, women's um, having children or not having children is, you know, defining them in, in society and um, society feels the need to dictate one way or the other how and when they should have children. 
I think we have one one other slide, and this is an older work um, that I think would be interesting to hear about and just give people a little bit of perspective of how you, you know, what, what you were doing a few years ago and you know, how your process evolved. Yeah, this is an older work I did in 2014, and it's nice that you choose that one because um, when I did this in 2014, I think nobody understood why I'm doing this. This is in um, Lower Austria. It's a the wine. It's a winery area, very beautiful landscape, and I was living there. And when while I was living there, suddenly they started to to build a motorway. Um, so this motorway construction harshly cut through the landscape and changed, of course, everything. So I was very sad seeing what the, these highways are doing with the landscape. And I went there. In the where in the morning, it's, it was around five or six in the morning, and I planted a row of these flowers. They are called Euphorbia diamond. In German, it's Zauberschnee, which means magic snow. And I created a symbolic median strip, um, which highlights the function of a road. And at this time, so I did this for the camera, and then for the rabbits, because the rabbits came and ate the flowers. A few years, a few, few hours later, the plants were already gone because the machines came. And now this um, work is shown on an exhibit in an exhibition called Ecoland Art, where, where now it's they are talking about how, how we should not. How we should work ephemeral with with the nature and not work like probably land art was done in the 70s. So I'm happy that this now is understood what I wanted to do then. Do we have time for a couple of questions possibly? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Oh. <laughs> um, Joseph had an interesting question, and maybe this can be more of a global question. Um, he had asked specifically what will happen to Nimwa's installation um, when it's removed, but I wondered more broadly, what happens to these pieces when they are taken down? Who shall answer? Me or Henner? Well, I I can answer only so far as to say when it gets taken down from Nimo, we're sending it um, we're sending it back to you in Austria. So, yeah. um, so I I collect all the the nets and um, they are shown now on different exhibitions on the one hand side or. At the beginning, I was thinking that I could also um, um, montage it on other buildings. Um, but when people contact us, they always want a new sentence because there are so many preferences. And um, that's why we do new ones. And yeah, so this is they are shown at exhibitions and and or I sell them. And on our social media profile, you can see, uh, find some fun images and clips how they're washed and um, <laughs> depending on their size. And <laughs> um, there's some fun images there for anybody who would like to check it out on social media. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. I think you also have some um, videos as well, some video clips of um, the work going up in Washington and kind of reactions of, of people passing by um, that are really, really fun to watch and really interesting. Um, that's the great thing about public art, right? Like it's really for everybody. And I have to say, I was, I was out of town um, when you unveiled it and I saw it, I think, on our social media account. And 
the public reaction to it. And I just felt so happy and so proud. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's fairly, um, I don't want to say radical. That's, that's not quite the right word, but for Washington, which is, you know, fairly and conservative in, in, I'm thinking of like the color in particular, right? Like it's maybe not conservative. That's a loaded term, but like classical, right? It's a very kind of classical architecture and everything's kind of, you know, that doesn't really change too much um, in, in terms of the colors of the city, but this hot pink on the side of our building um, and the message it's conveying is just, I just found it to be so energizing um, and makes me really excited for the opening of our building. And I hope makes everybody else excited for it too. Yeah, I think as well, Ginny, like one thing that was really exciting sort of being on the ground when we were installing was being able to see passersby reaction. Um, you know, I think obviously DC is a city that has quite a lot of museums and, you know, there are other museums doing public art. The Hirshhorn, of course, has their building wrapped as well. But I think Nimwa's location right downtown, like that's not necessarily a thing people are as used to seeing in that location. Um, so it was really interesting, um, you know, when we were installing and we were kind of on the ground below and it was being unfurled and, you know, making all of these adjustments, like the types of people walking by, it was everyone from, you know, tourists to people who work in the nearby businesses who are out getting lunch to people who are on their way to the metro. And, you know, of course the installation process was like involved and that was eye-catching, but the work itself is very eye-catching too in a way that if you are anywhere near our neighborhood, um, you know, you really can't ignore the work and it is visible from so many through ways like that's the intersection of so many major streets and you know it really is um very present kind of no matter how you are coming through that neighborhood and that intersection and i think that's been a really cool thing about it and can you remind how long it's it's up until sure yeah so it will be up until february 26. we have another question. We have a few minutes left. Maybe we'll take this last question from Mary. Um, they ask, to what extent can artistic works and cultural expression affect corporate and government policies? Any Anyone have thoughts on that? <laughs> to what extent can artistic works and cultural expression affect corporate and government policies? That's, that's a, I mean, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I think it's, I think, I think protest in and of itself is an art form, if you think about it. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's performative, you know, to, a, to a specific end. And I think that um, you know, if we if we broaden our understanding of art, right, um, to include things like you know free speech and protests and um, you know those kinds of actions taken, I think it can be very influential. Um, and I think I think that's what art does best, not to wax too you know, philosophical here, but it it takes difficult issues and it kind of makes us see them in a new way, in different ways. Um, so I, I, I think it, I think it can I think it can make a change. I think um, you know it might not happen as quickly as as some of us might hope, but I think it's an important part of um, of the process. Um. I think what, what I experience or what we experience is that um, a lot of people start to discuss. And I think this is something which um, we lose more and more, this conversation and this discussing about things. We, we are very fast in social media to react and to like or unlike. And so um, when, when we did this installation, for example, at the cathedral, 
uh, in Innsbruck, in my hometown. It's a very conservative Catholic area. There were so many discussions and also old people with young people and all genders were starting to discuss these um, topics or this, this sentence which we choose as long as God has a beard, I will be a feminist. And I think it's a it's an, a, a possibility to I'm I'm I hope and but I'm probably also quite optimistic and I'm also sure that it will change something. Better yeah. doing something like this than doing nothing. Yeah, I think that's a really perhaps a beautiful way for us to sort of wrap up our time together, this idea that that art and specifically your work can be generative and can encourage dialogue in ways that um, don't often you know, enter discourse. So we appreciate so much uh, the work on our building, um, more than you can even imagine. And um, we appreciate your time, Katerina and Marguerite, for joining us today, late in your day and early in ours. Um, I just want to thank Hannah as well for joining us and everyone who is involved in making this project a reality, including all of our construction folks who are involved, because I know that that's, it's a big, uh, it's a big process um, and Hannah definitely managed that as well. So thank you all. For those of you who are, who are in DC, we hope you'll be able to come by the museum and take a look at this amazing work of art. And we will certainly, we, there's a lot of information on our website as well. So you can visit it virtually if you can't see it in person. And I'll pass it off to Ginny to conclude. Yes, thank you, Katerina and Margareta and Hannah for joining us today. Um, it was a fascinating discussion. Um, I hope that you know we we stay in touch beyond this and we follow what you do because I'm I'm sure there are other great things in store. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much also for the the possibility to work with you. It was really or it is a great. It's really great to work with you and and we are really very happy to to have realized this wonderful net with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Oh, I was gonna say feeling down. Yeah. <laughs> Gerne. <laughs> Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Schönen Abend. I have to say here, <laughs> beautiful night or evening. I'll just mention quickly um, the slide that's up now. Our next NIMWA Exchange episode airs on Tuesday, March 14th at noon Eastern time. Curators from the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Art Gallery of Ontario will discuss their upcoming exhibition, which aims to present a feminist revision of early modern European history. You know, no, no big thing. <laughs> So, you know, feminist revision of, of all of it. Um, it's a, it's going to be a fascinating exhibition. Um, and it will include paintings from our collection, from Nimmo's collection, as well as works of silver from our collection by women. So register today. Again, thanks, everybody. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>